Praise the heavens for Indian food. <laughs> Seriously, oh my god. After 10 years, I'm still not bored and I keep finding on finding out new dishes and new things. This uh, fellow teacher uh, told me this uh, incident. He said, oh Sadhguru, how is it to ride the, the Segway? And Sadhguru looked at him and said, it's just like life. Uh, you're not supposed to drive it, you're supposed to ride it. That sentence sometimes rings in my ears. If somebody is from uh, Holland or from Netherlands, they mostly uh, speak like this. But uh, if you are from Italy, of course, first thing you notice is the hands uh, go all over the place. That was Hindi for the unin uninitiated. <laughs> my basic Telugu, somehow the neurons fa found each other and strung a sentence together and I quickly said Rendu kindaki, at which all the other volunteers were like Anna, you speak Telugu? <laughs> I was really like, yes, 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 <laughs> you did it. <laughs> after inner engineering, what made you come to India? So after inner engineering, I picked up uh, a few other practices from Isha also, still there in Lebanon, because to my great fortune, pretty much everything was available there. Mm. So I did uh, Bhava Spandana or BSP, I did Shunya, and um, I even learned yoga asanas at the time, though I was least impressed with that practice out of all, and I became a yoga teacher, go figure. So then I started thinking, okay, I definitely don't want to go back to any kind of office job, even if it's a fancy international organization or company, I don't care, because it's anyway going to eat me alive, and I don't want to go through that kind of process again. But seeing the transformation in myself and the people around me, I thought maybe the creator or life is trying to tell me something, maybe this is my path. So, I mean, I didn't think in such a romantic ways at the time. I just was looking for what shall I do that I can last in for more than a year. Hmm. Th that was my pragmatic approach. Okay. Is there anything I can do for more than a year? <laughs> Which hmm. was already going to be a miracle if I would have pulled it off. I spoke to the inner engineering teacher uh, and one more teacher. They both said, yeah, you can, you can consider the teacher training in, in Isha and uh, become an inner engineering teacher. And uh, they explained me a bit some of the details. And uh, then I thought, oh, okay, teaching on a volunteer basis with no remuneration, centrally scheduled classes and no control over my whereabouts and living in an ashram in India, I thought, wow, that's a bit intense. It's too many new things. I don't think I can cope, it, mm. cope with that as of right now. So I was interested, but I thought I'm not sure exactly that is my path. I looked on Google for... I just searched globally for teacher trainings mm. and I couldn't find anything that was even remotely close to the one offered by, by Isha Foundation because everything that I found was maximum one or two months in terms of residential full-time teacher trainings I'm mm. talking. The one by Isha, 21 weeks, so that's about five months. So I thought, okay. Plus having this uh, at least partial experience with Isha programs and having a little bit of trust in Sadhguru and his methodology, I thought, okay, that's probably the way to go because I thought I don't know what yoga is exactly, but if I want to take it up, I should do it in the best possible way and in the most profound possible way. So let's just go for the most comprehensive teacher training, which at that time looked to me to be that one. And uh, as per my knowledge, it's still the longest uh, residential teacher training in the world. Was it challenging to be a part of Isha Hatha Yoga teachers training program? There are two answers. There is yes and there is yes. <laughs> it's a double yes. So. I'd never had South Indian food in my life because abroad it's mostly North Indian food that you find. Mm. I never sat on the ground while eating. I never used my hands for eating except pizza or a sandwich, which is occasional. Contrary to popular belief, we don't eat pasta and pizza every day. <laughs> and well, let's say walking with open shoes all day, not used to that. Mm. Um, having a super regimented daily schedule, every day same, mm. not at all used to that. I just spent 10 years living, you know. Mm. Living la vida loca, as the song says, <laughs> just living as per my own, whatever I chose to do. Huh. So, couldn't have a starker contrast with a fully organized, structured lifestyle. Basically, you're up by around 4.30 in the morning and you sleep around 9.30, 10 p.m. or something. Only two meals, also first time in my life, surviving on two meals. Yeah, so there were a bit of challenges. and uh, But I think the biggest single challenge was the constant body pains. 
Nowadays, teachers who go for the teacher training, they have already learned some of that yoga. At that time, to put it bluntly, if you had, you know, two arms and two legs, you can enroll <laughs> and, uh, and a willingness to stay. So like me, other people who are not super duper flexible uh, or, or gifted, you could say. But of course, there, is a, there was even that time an interview process. They did screen us and try to see are we really interested to actually teach also. Mm. Do, do you think the program is justified? And because whatever we have to pay for this program, people think it's too high. What do you want to say about it? Interestingly enough, the same comment also comes to me as a teacher when people want to enroll for our classes. Hmm. Because especially here uh, in India, um, I want to say Bharat actually, but India is so ingrained in the head. But the teacher training is coming and then... Uh, uh, so when people want to enroll, they will say, oh, it's so expensive, you know, what, what is this? Why can't you offer for less and this and that? Well, first of all, the, the, the same programs when we offer in the West are eight times the fee in India. Mm. But the purchasing power of people in the West is definitely not eight times of a person in a metro city in India. Mm. Not at all. Maybe double in Europe mm. or triple at the most, not eight times. So first of all, uh, for Indians, if, if they are critical of the fees, first of all, please get out of the 100 rupee uh, yoga class mentality. That's my first point. <laughs> Second point is, uh, okay, you want it for free. Anything that's for free has to be paid by someone. Free things don't exist except the oxygen you breathe and the sunlight that hits your face. There's nothing else which is free as far as I know. People only value what they pay for. And if you look at the programs that are offered by Isha, so many things are offered free of cost. Many, many things. Mm. Uh, rural education, uh, the mobile clinics uh, in Tamil Nadu. Um, so many things uh, that are offered by uh, Isha Vidya or other uh, branches of Isha are at a, a cost mm. uh, price or, or w well below that. Uh, Project Green Hands, reforestation. So many things are done at a very tight budget mm. and, and for free for the person enrolling in it. So uh, that argument that Isha is a rich people's foundation kind of the thing, it doesn't hold any water. It doesn't make really much sense once you put a magnifying glass to it. So you have been teaching as a Hatha Yoga teacher since last 10 years. We want to know your experience. What made you stick to being a teacher, a Hatha Yoga teacher? Yes, so finally I, I picked up something that I could do for more than one year. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Which I think myself and anyone around me would have never thought possible. Okay. They thought this guy will be a, a ball in the, in the flipper. Uh, you know, he'll be like a flipper ball or a ping pong ball for the rest of his life. Mm. So it's been 10 years. So I myself am surprised and very grateful. I think <clears throat> the simplest answer to the question is the gratitude in people's eyes and the kind of transformation that you see on a daily basis. Because I never had that satisfaction in other jobs. They were so abstract and you don't really see the real impact of your job. So in that, I always liked catering jobs a lot because it's simple, but you have a direct satisfaction. You give somebody a drink or food, they're happy, they smile, they say, thank you. Oh, it was delicious. It was great. Mm. We have a chit chat with them. Mm. So there you have the direct satisfaction of something concrete, but there is no real transformation. This is the additional point that I get from being an instructor, a yoga instructor, which is something very practical and tangible and very profound and lasting transformation for those who are willing to stick to the practices. Initially, I never used to understand when Sadhguru says uh, in, in many interviews or videos, he says the biggest joy for him is the, the tears and the faces and the, and the joy of the volunteers and the transformation that they go through. And, uh, but I kind of feel that in, a, in, a small, in my uh, small experience of my own life, I can say the same thing is true for me. Mm. Seeing people touched and transformed by something Something I didn't even make up. I just learned the basics just enough, just well enough to transmit it. That's about it. Often I see people in my class, I have no idea what's happening to them. So obviously something else is functioning mm. other than my, uh, uh, you know, capabilities. So being part of something like that is, it's, uh, it's absolutely crazy. It's really, really a blessing. Anna, you're a well-known person in the Hatha Yoga teachers community. Tell us something about it. Yes, we're all big celebrities in our small world, right? <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> One thing is uh, I, I quite uh, enjoy supporting the more recent graduates 
um, in different ways and I have been since quite a few years mm. and uh, specifically one thing that I'm part of as a board member is a uh, an initiative called uh, um, CHY, or short for Classical Hatha Yoga, which is a website and a platform for collaboration among Hatha Yoga teachers and posting of classes. Mm. So what most people don't know is what the classes that they see on the Isha Foundation website, Hatha Yoga classes, is less than 10% of what is actually being offered. There's way more classes. There are, may, uh, there are way more classes which are being offered mm. independently by teachers and uh, these are advertised privately or independently through Facebook, Instagram and other uh, means, WhatsApp. Hmm. So to give more visibility and more platform, we're you know, bringing teachers together under that banner. And then of course they can decide to collaborate also. And uh, one unique thing about this platform is we're tying up with social media influencers hmm. who are willing to either make a video on the topic or simply put uh, one uh, link under their videos as part of their uh, affiliates mm. um, or just maybe they want to promote maybe even without being an affiliate but let's say we we have this we have built this opportunity for people to partner as affiliates what all programs are there in in hatha yoga that you as a hatha yoga teacher teach actually there are so many hatha yoga programs most of them people are not so aware of so i can start by answering you in the reverse way <laughs> which is to <laughs> say what we're not teaching huh. we're not teaching inner engineering okay uh, we don't teach bhava spandana or shunya or guru puja we teach uh, for example surya kriya angamardana upa yoga bhuti shuddhi yoga asanas those are the five commonly offered practices which people will find advertised all over the place besides that we teach eye care practices the female hatha yoga teachers teach uh, yoga uh, for pregnant ladies then we have modules for Bhastrika Kriya, Shanmukhi Mudra. We have, um, yeah, and then we have different well being uh, and treatment modules also for people with specific uh, conditions. Even if people don't look for a specific treatment module, but they have some chronic issue or something, they can just enroll for any of these Hatha Yoga programs. As a rough guide, if somebody watching this wants to take up an Isha program but doesn't know where to start, if I would say if you want something slow, precise, and meditative, and or with a more spiritual inclination, mm. Surya Kriya or Yoga Asanas will be a place to start. If you want a simple, not so physical process, so not so physically engaging process, which is a bit mystical and esoteric, Bhuti Shuddhi is maybe your first program. If you want to do something very physically engaging, something that shatters your notions about yoga <laughs> and that makes you super fit also, Surya Shakti or Angamardana could be wonderful ways to start. If somebody has pre-existing injuries or they're a little senior or they have restricted mobility, the online Upa Yoga can be a great starting point. But I would suggest such people to at some point do get in touch with the teachers to get your practices looked at. So if I want to have independent classes or suppose I want to conduct Hatha Yoga classes in my premise, in the, in the premise of my society, is it possible? Yes, it's possible. So as independent uh, classical Hatha Yoga teachers formed by Isha, we, are, uh, we teach in uh, colleges, schools, um, hotels, residential societies, retreats, you name it. Wherever we can ensure that there is a certain level of committed atmosphere, which varies from program to program, to, watch, to which degree it is needed, mm. we can pretty much teach anywhere. So many people believe that if they start doing yoga, they have to do yoga whole day. Yeah. Now you as a Hatha Yoga teacher, what, what is the amount of time that you dedicate yourself for doing your practices and how is your daily schedule? The different notions or stereotypes that people have towards yoga here and in the West. So here people generally think, oh, if I go to a class, my family will think I'll become a brahmachari you know, or a monk and I'll... I'll renounce my job and my family or I'll not get married. Yeah. Worst nightmare of an Indian parent. Uh, or not become a doctor or an IT professional. Yeah. Or somehow, you know, wander off in the Himalayas and be lost in time and space. Christians and Muslims think, oh, it's some Hindu something something, mm -hmm. which is very unfortunate. Whereas in, uh, in Western countries, uh, 
many people think oh uh, this is uh, uh, again this is some hindu something or maybe it's a religious something at the same time there are many many people who have broken out of the let's say stereotypical cultural norms especially in the west because of uh, what i mentioned earlier this kind of cultural fatigue or lack of cultural revival or interest uh, that people have so people are looking for elements from the east mm. so in that yoga and spirituality can be very powerful both in italy or here in, in india when i teach i come across these different things all the time so it, it's kind of amusing in a way in terms of daily routine there is a main uh, distinguishing factor do i have a class on that day or not i'll just be going on maybe two and a half three hours usually if i don't have a class i'll mm. go for that amount of time in, in in one sitting in the morning then uh, i'll have a meal mm, around 10 30 11 if i know the meal is being pushed back i'll have some soaked groundnuts and or some fruits around 9 30 10 or right after the practices are done mm. and then i'll calmly wait till whatever 12 12 30 needed then uh, in the daytime i have my other activities so i'll be working even in between my work usually i i put a timer so every 25 or 50 minutes i'll get up and i'll do some or the other small physical activity either just walking around or i do the simple upa yoga practices which people can also find online which are all five minute practices so just to change the posture and relieve the tension from sitting down at the laptop which is obviously a, a, not a natural position mm -hmm. and staring at an artificial light so i also go to the balcony i'll just stare into the void to relax my eyes try to look at trees also it's supposed to be good to look at the tree from a distance um, the color natural colors and natural air late afternoon early evening just before dinner usually 5 30 ish i'll again have a shower mm. if it's summer anyway i'll shower four or five times a day but minimum is twice <laughs> morning once and, and late afternoon early evening once and then if it's 6 20 i sit sit for sadguru presence time and that's it then by 6 30 i'll involve myself with the dinner if i have a class everything is more broken up mm. classes are mostly in the morning so i'll do some practice before some practice at the venue just before the class if possible depending on the amount of people and depending on the support or not of volunteers right after the class so it's always an improvisation on a daily basis how much of my practices am i able to do mm. so it's a constant uh, fine tuning and adjustment we all know that the usage of ai is on rise nowadays and people may use it in a bad way also as we came across recently uh, a message that was being circulated among social media platforms uh, in which Sadhguru's voice was dubbed and it was used in a not so good way. Okay. So what would you like to say about it? I think it's a little inevitable uh, these kind of things because uh, as Sadhguru often says in various platforms technology is uh, it's neither good or bad it depends on the usage people want to make use of it mm. so as with AI or any technology that is going to come up in the coming years or decades or centuries the the fundamental issue of whether it will be used in a positive or negative way will always depend on the consciousness uh, or the evolution state of evolution of the human being who is involved with the technology so yeah it, it could lead uh, down to some uh, dark uh, pathways this is many years ago uh, during an upgrade i think one of my fellow teachers saw Sadhguru on the segway a few years ago that was the first uh, self-balancing uh, you know, vehicle on two wheels mm. <laughs> so Sadhguru was driving it around the ashram so you're supposed to lean forward or something and then this thing starts going this uh, fellow teacher uh, told me this uh, incident he said oh Sadhguru, how is it to how is it to ride the, this segway and Sadhguru looked at him and said, uh, it's just like life. Uh, uh, you're not supposed to drive it. You're supposed to ride it. Oh. So I was like, wow. <laughs> Even in such a small, simple encounter, he just gave such a profound statement. And uh, that sentence sometimes rings in my ears because we tend to be so kind of control freaks know, about so many aspects of life. Yeah, Whereas uh, oftentimes if we take a little bit more laid back approach, yet be very involved, mm. so many opportunities or possibilities open up. I was volunteering for a program as uh, security, uh, me as security, it looks ridiculous. I don't know if the camera shows how thin I am. If I turn sideways, you might think I might be blown away and picked up <laughs> by the window. So 
So I was part of the security. Uh, we worked in eight hour shifts, three shifts. So sometimes I was doing night duty. So I was mastering the art of sleeping in vertical position <laughs> and just, you know, keeping an eye, keeping an eye, literally one eye, trying to keep one eye open. And uh, because it was a program that requires participants to be really isolated from the rest of the uh, Isha Yoga Center because it's a very advanced program, the so-called uh, Samyam Hour Silence program. Maybe some people watching this may not know, Sadhguru has never been late a single time to a single event in 35 plus years. And though other people might be late, he's never late. And every single event that I've attended, I can attest to this fact, he's never late. In fact, he comes well ahead of time. How he does it, <laughs> I have no idea. Sadhguru was waiting for his moment to enter that particular hall because he was supposed to conduct one of the sessions there. So he's standing there and uh, he comes walking and I was one of few people who saw him there because we were supposed to keep that door shut mm. uh, because participants are roaming and then other volunteers have other activities. I had nothing to do. I'm, I'm on guard. <laughs> so I'm there and I'm observing and he just comes walking and uh, there are a few plants on one side. He just walks there and he just looks at the flowers like this. And he just smiles and he touches, goes to another plant, he looks at the leaves and he kind of, I don't remember the exact gesture, it's kind of like as if he was kind of greeting or caressing the plant. It was like a, a kid who has never seen a flower in his life, that's how he approached it. I was just mesmerized, the, the tenderness and the intensity uh, in which he was doing that and I was one of three or four people to see that and my jaw was like on the floor because I had seen him in so many different situations, a very intense and very serious situations or very jovial situations. And now this was a completely different intensity which I had never seen. Mm. At the same time, he was so playful with the plant and uh, he's just kind of toying with the plant and looking at it and just appreciating, you know, how it's growing. And like that, he spent a few minutes and then he walked in and uh, did his session. It really touched me seeing him like that. Also during Samyama, at some point near the main entrance, you have the, the small road that leads to the Adiyogi Alayam and the cottages. That small road, Sadhguru came driving super slow. He could afford to because uh, there were very few people in the ashram and everybody was involved or in the Samyama silence program. So he asked to meet all the volunteers, whoever didn't have a strictly necessary role to just or shift to come out and meet him. So we sat on the grass, that small grass in the middle. When he removes his footwear and walks to the dais, it almost looks, <laughs> I know this sounds really ridiculous, it almost looks like he's floating in the air because I, I've never seen a human being who, who is walking yet doesn't seem to be touching the ground. This is, I'm not talking about an optical illusion. That's not how I perceive it. I just perceive it somebody whose own footprint on the world is so non-existent because it's all in his doing and in his action and in his message that he kind of doesn't weigh on this planet. I don't know how else to say it. Uh, even the way I said it right now, I just made it up on the spot. Because it's almost like <laughs> uh, he'll touch and roll and like if he was walking on grass, I would say immediately the blade turns back up. I can't say that I've seen it, but that's how it feels mm -hmm. to be. It's so gentle, his footsteps, as if he is a, you know, a, a one-year-old uh, kid yeah. that just learned walking and tick, 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 goes like that. But of course, in his case, in a very controlled and slow manner. So anyway, that way he walked towards the volunteers. We were all sitting. They told us, you know, just be calm, sit down. You know, don't get up in between, otherwise the Guru might have to cut short his, his delivery. So then he kept it very brief. But first of all, he did something he does in so many programs. And no matter it's thousands or hundreds or a couple of dozen people, I always have the same feeling. He looks at every single person. He'd be like this, watching. So he took his time. Then he, he just said one thing. That was the whole uh, darshan at the moment, that improvised darshan. He just said... I keep traveling and journalists keep asking me over and over the same things. And the most consistent question is, what, what is your proudest achievement? Or what do you want to be remembered for? And he said, 
the proudest achievement and most memorable thing for me is the millions of people around the world who uh, who throw their life into activities related to Isha and who are able to function for large periods of time without any anger, without any frustration and, and just give themselves uh, that quality of people. You cannot buy it. You cannot train it also. I mean, all of us were in tears because the way he delivered it, you could see and all of us may have heard a similar message many times, those of us who were volunteering that day, myself included, but the way he looked at us and the way he said it, it was the most heartfelt kind of compliment he could give. There's nothing beyond that. Then again, he just looked at us and uh, he quietly stepped into his car and drove off to the program hall. <laughs> so it was so intense. It was really, really intense. Like most of us couldn't move for a couple of minutes. We were just sitting there. Some people were just crying. Other people were just like, like me. I was just like, you yeah, well, <laughs> in a kind of mode, trying to process what has just happened. With this, it's time for our rapid fire round. Let's see how rapidly Anna answers. Do I have to wear a shield <laughs> for the rapid fire? <laughs> Bulletproof not. vest? No, not no. needed. Okay. Okay. So the first question. How does Isha Hatha Yoga differ from other yoga practices? No music, no props. We'd never touch participants. This is a different level of intimacy that people have to experience themselves, not through touch of someone else. And we don't use any mirrors. So it's a completely inward experience where you have to figure out yourself and improve yourself. Wow, such a wonderful answer. Next question. Apart from yoga, what did you find interesting about India? <laughs> For that, we need another five podcasts. <laughs> Okay, but uh, off the top of my head, food, praise the heavens for Indian food, <laughs> seriously, oh my god. After 10 years, I'm still not bored and I keep finding, on, finding out new dishes and new things. I have also some really magic hands in my family here who are super gifted cooks and who know different styles of cuisine. So yeah, what can I say? It's too fantastic. <laughs> food? Okay, let me not only answer food, otherwise people think I'm only eating outside of my yoga classes so food for sure um, I like that people are quite outgoing um, people like to engage in situations and people let each other be I enjoy the chaos of the driving first few months I was cursing and yelling continuously then one day I flipped the switch I said okay uh, Either you drive here and you that means you go with the flow or you're going to lose your mind. So I decided that I will just go with the flow. And ever since when I drive in Europe now, people are terrified because I have to mentally switch to, okay, lane discipline, okay, speed limits. I, I, I like uh, zigzagging, especially on the two-wheeler, on the scooter. It's, it's fantastic. But I think what really kept me here other than meeting the love of my life also. Not a small phenomenon at all. Um, many foreigners who visit India, why they are so charmed by India, it's not, it's not only or not just the food, the colors, the smells, the spices, the intensity of, of the life. There is some kind of because that will give you an initial impression. But I think what makes the impression long lasting is because if you spend enough time here or if you, if you pick up any spiritual practice and continue back home, so in, 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 a, in a way you're carrying the essence of this land back home. And if you nurture it, somewhere along the line you'll discover that there is a very thick spiritual ethos an undercurrent which even most indians are totally unaware of mm. unless they engage in some spiritual process mm. and that uh that alone it makes everything worthwhile because you you kind of realize that this is one of the few cultures in the world that somehow made this science of well-being possible and it is the most ancient science of well-being and the most complete signs of well-being. I would dare even somebody who's not into spirituality or yoga to come here, stay more than a month or two and have interaction with people 
not just stay in your hotel and go in a tour bus then if you're that kind of tourist forget about what i'm saying you can skip to the next part of the podcast <laughs> you if you have this much time and energy to dedicate it will not leave you untouched and you'll talk about it for the rest of your days because it is unmissable and unmistakable and it i've not found it in any other country in the world can you share a favorite italian proverb or saying that resonates with your yoga journey non è sempre oro ciò che luccica which basically means not not all that shines is gold mm. let's say until i did my teacher training it was about 10 years of completely outward focused people languages experiences yeah only focused on the on the outside mm. at the time i didn't realize i thought you know becoming relevant and knowledgeable and maybe at some point important in life happens through absorption of people experiences languages and then with the teacher training i made a 180 degree turn basically and mm. it was a fully uh, fully inward looking process of 5 months but within those two, 10 years also at some point i asked myself the question okay what if i do another 10 years like this okay i'll go to more countries i'll learn more languages i'll meet more people but what am i really looking for and i didn't really have an answer that kind of spooked me a bit so maybe that's where i found out that you know all these 10 years many things looked like gold I did find quite a lot of gold also mm. but it was not it was a pretext to something else that I was looking for which was actually on the inside f- for which I needed a different lens mm. which is what yoga gave me mm. in fact in the past I've referred to yoga as the silent language that I was looking for how would you explain about isha or sadguru to an italian or dash first of all yoga is has uh, very little to do with hinduism as a religion so it is simply a science for well-being sadguru often brings this example of the bmw car if the bmw car doesn't care you're a muslim or a christian or a jew or a hindu if you know how to use those three pedals or now these two pedals uh this car will take you places if you're randomly kicking the pedals this car that might enhance your life and take you from a to b it will take your life also mm. you might crash it in a tree so does it mean the car is dangerous no you are dangerous similarly Uh, with yoga if you learn techniques from a proper source and you apply them properly without your own adding your own masala or nonsense to it then the impact of those practices can be of a certain kind a certain percentage of people who end up in mental institutions are because of improper yoga mm. and uh, guess that that's mainly because they did something of their own not through something learned in an established and proper way the practice or the person offering it or the guru behind it do i have any even little positive inclination if you have that that's good enough mm. so to people in the west but also in the east i would say by now there's so much material available online just watch a couple of sadguru videos at some point you yourself will say okay how many more videos i'm going to watch or do i want to experience what he's saying what is your favorite aspect of guiding others through their yoga journey in terms of perceived importance from the society or the world or 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 status or privilege i might be maybe much better off working as a language interpreter or something else or in the political field mm. as i was hoping to do but i felt that real transformation of individuals is not possible through politics or business or any other means because those are all group efforts they can't really touch the individual you cannot legislate a country or a population or a city's inhabitants towards good behavior you can only that is only incentive and punishment carrot and stick so you still haven't transformed them you're only coercing them positively or negatively in a certain direction which will never work over a period of time it is bound to fail somewhere down the line so seeing the transformation within me and the people around me through the yoga practices I thought this is the most efficient and best way to spend my time and it keeps people as much as possible also out of the clutches of the medical establishment mm. with all due respect for some of the good work that's also being done but uh, by and large it seems to be more and more of a kind of conspiracy against the actual health and well-being so I'm not so happy about that so I want to keep showing people the alternative of taking care of yourself first and foremost because first and foremost you are responsible for your health not your doctor What is the biggest challenge when it comes to learning hatha yoga? Discipline. <laughs> yes. 
most people busy because it's so part and parcel of all the advertisements and movies everybody's supposed to sit all day on a recliner and smoke and drink and not care about life and just yeah whatever order from Swiggy and Zomato uh, get your groceries delivered become a potato couch and and keep buying things of course food medications because you have to keep you know the corporate uh, happy at least some section of the uh, you know things will work for you while in the real world outside your little matrix uh, things are being done outside of your knowledge so this kind of lazy this kind of prompt for people to be lazy distracted disinterested and disengaged in life is extremely dangerous cocktail mm. and I think it's naturally leading people to become mentally very unstable and desperate because you're more connected than ever at the same time you're more disconnected than ever mm. because the real interaction the delayed gratification that comes from real interactions and working for something and not knowing is it going to come back to me or not that thing is totally absent in the last five or ten years and will be going forward if the technology continues to evolve the way it's evolving now mm. so in that context very important to have something that you yourself control that you yourself nurture because at the end of the day we're still an analog being unless 50 years down the line we're going to be fully implanted with chips and other things i don't know mm -hmm. but first and foremost you are a human being with made of bones and flesh so the yoga helps you to access that mm -hmm. after that what technology you use in your life i mean up to you up to you last question what advice do you give to those who are new to yoga i would say uh, just start with one practice and stick to it for at least three to six months ideally six months is good don't hop from one thing to the other unless it doesn't bring any satisfaction but don't don't find the, the lazy and easy way out of keep on trying things just because you got a little bit bored if if at least one little bit one little part of you says hey this has some value then just stick to it and find out what is there uh, is there a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow uh, because for some people the impact is instant other people weeks other people months other people it may take years mm. it's very hard to, to say and I think by and large people give up way too easily and if you learn a hundred million things then you end up practicing nothing which is kind of what happened to me in the first two years I was seeking genuinely but I couldn't really stick to anything for better or for worse but then when I did, did find something I just super glued myself to it and just yeah <laughs> hang on for dear life <laughs> you are a native speaker of italian and dutch yes can you give a sound bite for our audience who has not been to these places so uh, if somebody is from uh, holland or from netherlands they mostly uh, speak like this and uh, you will quickly realize that oh maybe this is a dutch person enough for the italian but uh, if you are from italy of course first thing you notice is the hands that go all over the place and uh, the vowels are very stretched and uh, if you like uh, sports you can uh, just watch an interview with your favorite italian athlete and you will hear something exactly like this <laughs> <laughs> okay so you wanted the sound bite of italian and dutch so let's take a, a simple sentence like i've come i've come to the isha yoga center and it's a beautiful place can you say this sentence in all the nine languages that you know Okay. Ik ben naar de naar het Isha Yoga Center gegaan en het is een prachtige plaats. This was Dutch. Sono andato al centro Isha ed è un posto favoloso. This was Italian. English we already know. Je suis allé au centre Isha, c'est un endroit magnifique. This was French. Me fui al centro de Isha en in, en la India, es un lugar meraviglioso. Maravilloso, sorry. This was Spanish. Okay, now the next one. <clears throat> ich war im Isha Yoga Center in Indien. Es war wunderschön. This was German. Ja, Bulf Centre Isha Yoga. At the Ochim Prikrasnaya Miesta. This was Russian. Can it be Isha Yoga Center? Halmakan Ktir Ktir Hello. This was Arabic. This, specifically, this was Lebanese Arabic. 
मैं ईशा योगा सेंटर में गया था ये जगह ये जगह बहुत सुंदर है दैट वॉज हिंदी फॉर डोज फॉर दिन अन इनिशिएटेड नैन ईशा योगा सेंटर वेला अभी चाल अंदम प्रदेश दिस् वॉज तेल सो वन ऐ वॉज वाली फॉर इन इंजीनियर प्रोग्राम इट वॉज मी एंड ऑल नॉर्थ इंडियन दिस वॉज इन हईदराबाद कपल ऑफ इयर्स अगो वी हेड जस्ट रैप्ड अप द मेन डे ऑफ द प्रोग्राम एंड वी हेड लॉड ऑफ एडबल लेफ्ट ओवर्स विच आर जनरली डोनेटेड टू अ गोशाला सो द पर्सन हू कैम विथ अ स्मो पिकअप ट्रक वॉट इज कॉमनली रिफर टू एज अ लॉरी इन इंडिया um and he he had packed all these leftovers in a huge black plastic cover to be taken to the goshala which is like a cow shed as the volunteers three four volunteers were lifting this heavy bag to him he was standing on the trolley he picked it up and was about to put it down and all of us could see the bag started to give away from underneath it was about to rip open and it would have made a disaster on his vehicle so It was like a split second decision. All of us were like looking at him, you know, like a movie slow mo where you go like no. <laughs> <laughs> But the volunteers were like I could see they they couldn't utter because they don't speak Telugu. So uh, at that time and unfortunately still the my basic Telugu somehow the neurons fa- found each other and strung a sentence together and I quickly said rendu chetulu kindiki. So he quickly put his arms underneath and he saved the back from being torn at which all the other volunteers were like Anna you speak Telugu <laughs> and I was there hasn't been there haven't been many prouder moment, moments in my life in this country as that moment I was really like yes 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 <laughs> you did it <laughs> oh god it was such a fun filled yet intense podcast I got to know so much about hatha yoga and a hatha yoga teacher and I hope you also did uh, I have a question for you at the end of this podcast here's the sentence and you have to translate it into your language and the sentence is I went to Isha yoga center and it is a very beautiful place let me know your answers in the comment section hit the like button if you like this podcast share comment and don't forget to subscribe namaskaram namaskaram, namaskaram. Thank you so much Anna for this podcast. Thank you. It was wonderful. <laughs>